Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Ian Mitra. I'm the editor of the Texas Tribune. Thank you for being here at the 2018 uh, Texas Tribune Festival, and thank you for braving the rain to, to come here. I'm glad we're not in one of the tents right now. Um, on behalf of the Tribune, uh, I want to welcome you to the eighth annual festival and our early indications panel. This is going to be a closer look at pre-K and early child education in Texas. Uh, before I introduce you to our wonderful panel, a couple of notes. Uh, this panel is presented by Raise Your Hand Texas and the Annie E. Casey Foundation. Um, and though corporate sponsors and donors underwrite this event, they play no role in determining the panel's content, panelists, or line of questioning. Uh, this weekend, please consider donating to our non nonprofit newsroom for a chance to win a Cosmic Marfa getaway, including a hotel accommodations by our friends at El Cosmico and dinner for two at Cochineal. Wow. Visit texastribune.org slash marfa2018 for full giveaway rules and make your donation now by texting Tribune to 444-999. All right, thank you guys very much for indulging me on that. Um, now uh, about the panel. We're gonna have about an hour uh, of discussion here. We're gonna keep it uh, moderated discussion for about 45 minutes or so and try to open it up for about 15 to 20 minutes of uh, Q&A. Um, you know, if you could, please put your cell phones on silent. If you uh, wanna tweet during the panel, uh, use the uh, hashtag TribFest18, and if, uh, if you guys are ready, I would love to introduce this panel. Let's start off, uh, just first to my left here is Dr. Sarah Bure, who has served as CEO of Pre-K4SA, uh, San Antonio's early learning initiative since 2016. Before joining Pre-K4SA, she worked as a professor of education and community leadership at Texas State University. Uh, next is Libby Doggett, who has served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Policy and Learning at the U.S. Department of Education. She served there from 2013 to 2017. Uh, now a consultant, she has previously worked for the Pew Charitable Trust and has worked on policy on the local, state, and national levels. Now uh, next to her is Mayor Betsy Price, who was first elected in 2011 to lead the city of Fort Worth. As mayor, she has helped launch Fort Worth's education initiative to promote early childhood education by aiming to have 100% of Fort Worth third graders read at or above grade level by 2025. And also we have Robert Kaplan, who has served as president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas since 2015. Previously, he was a professor and senior associate dean at Harvard Business School and the vice chairman of Goldman Sachs. So with that, I'd like to just drive right into it. And um, you know, we're coming into the 2017 session last time. We had a, you know, a cut in funding for our pre-K grant program. Even though the program had the you know, support and advocacy of the governor, there has been a little bit of disagreement about how to fund that, and the funding was cut, uh, I believe, about $118 million last session. So there seems to be a little bit of a, a disconnect about how we want to approach uh, pre-K as a state. Uh, Dr. Doggett, maybe we should start off with you. Where does Texas stand in relation to kind of other states and just how, in general on, uh, on its pre-K initiatives? Well, thank you, and thanks to our sponsors, and thanks to all of y'all for uh, coming on a rainy day. Um, it was pretty exciting to come back to Texas uh, after being gone 20 years and working on uh, pre-K around the, the country. And to see the excitement that's happened because we have amazing mayors and the, the great San Antonio project and even the Fed really interested in early learning. What was depressing is that 20 years ago, Texas was leading other states. And because we've only made very incremental changes over the last two decades, we've fallen behind. And so now Texas has a pre-K program, which is funded through the school funding formula, which is fantastic, which is where we want it. So four-year-olds at risk with military families and others can go to a pre-K program. It's only half day unless the cities, which the cities are doing, uh, fill in that other half day. Three-year-olds can go too, but most of that money is sitting on the table because school districts haven't been able to pull it down. And meanwhile, our infant toddlers that are in child care are in pretty abominable situations where they're very low standards and the state doesn't put any funding in. So we're faced with a problem of really good potential, lots of people interested, but a lack of money and because it only is half day and doesn't have high quality standards, there's a, there's a rating that's a 10 scale rating. Our program gets a four. Alabama gets a 10. Um, New Mexico gets a nine. Oklahoma gets an eight. So are these, these states that are around us that are poorer than Texas are rated higher. So we have a long way to go. Mr. Kaplan, you look at, you're looking at this from an economic standpoint or like broader based in the impact on Texas. Could you talk more about just from your viewpoint about the, ec the economic impact of this? 
So on the, on the positive side, the future of Texas is bright, but uh, GDP, gross domestic product, is made up of two things, growth in the workforce, and because of migration to this state, Texas is doing well in that, that the second key to GDP growth is growth and productivity. And in that regard, education is central. And I'm talking about math, science, and reading, uh, which we lag in Texas, and we lag as a nation versus the rest of the world, and skills training, okay, middle skills training, uh, automotive technicians, IT specialists, et cetera. Our studies have shown, and all the research we've looked at has shown, if kids start first grade behind grade level in reading, they never catch up. And so this is why pre-K uh, and what Dr. Doggett was talking about is so central. If we're going to grow GDP in the state and have a prosperous future, we've got to get kids earlier in zero to five so, so that when they start grade school, they're more on at, at grade level and we will have higher GDP and higher growth in the state. Right now, because we're lagging, this is a headwind for economic growth in the state of Texas. Dr. Bure and uh, Mayor Price, you both have worked obviously very hard on programs within your cities addressing this exactly. Could you talk a little bit, I'll start with you, Dr. Bure, just about kind of the, your work in the program you're doing and what is kind of exposed to you about kind of issues and challenges with early childhood education? So in San Antonio, Pre-K for SA, um, it, it was a city initiative started in 2012 because we didn't have enough slots available for all our four-year-olds in the city. At that time, we had about 6,000 children who did not have access to high-quality Pre-K. And the idea was to create a high-quality model. What does it look like when children have access to highly skilled teachers with an evidence-based curriculum? Because as Dr. Doggett talked about, it really is just quality is what matters. So mediocre pre-K is not gonna change much of anything, but high quality pre-K or high quality early learning has dramatic effects and there's a huge research base that supports that. And so that's our, our goal at Pre-K for SA is we serve 2,000 students directly each year, but then we also support um, grants and professional learning that increase the quality across San Antonio. And it's really about raising the quality in every single program so that every child has access to high quality early learning because we know it makes a tremendous difference. And people think it's about the academics but it's really about brain development. And so yes, it, it leads to higher academics, but it's really about that critical time in young children's lives where their brain is developing and we know that high quality early learning literally helps to build stronger brains. That's the, that's the real key and that's when you get this high achievement later on. Yeah, it really is. And we started a program two years ago called Read Fort Worth, and it's a collective impact program. And there are other cities doing it. We got in and, and using a, the data because you can't sell this program if you're not data based. And most of the business community is really not aware of where we are on early childhood. They're not surprisingly very much aware of where the state is, and the city of Fort Worth is just like every other major city. The biggest risk of regression for the Texas miracle, so-called, for our economy is a lack of quality public education. And it starts with early child care. Read Fort Worth is unusual because it is not publicly funded. It is a private, public-private partnership with uh, Matt Rose from Burlington Northern heading it up, my office and our school district. And the goal was to start zero to third grade, because third grade, as you all know, is the benchmark for whether kids succeed or not. And education's always been one of my passions. So we started it, and we've been looking at the data and realized every major city in Texas, and Fort Worth is right there with them, only three out of every 10 of our kids leave third grade, reading at third grade level they're five times more likely to drop out or never work above minimum wage if they don't read at third grade level. But the deeper we got into that, and I'm proud to say in two years we've moved the needle, and now this year's data shows that Fort Worth is 37%. And that's better, but not good enough. But as we got into it, we quickly realized to succeed with 100 by 2025, because that's when Baby's Barn, the year we started this would be third grade in 2025, that we had to tackle early childhood education. And it's abysmal. And I, Bob and I were discussing on all of us, 
when you think about the level of quality for pre-K teachers, not pre-K teachers, but for child care, from zero to wherever they start kindergarten, whoever cuts your hair or does your manicures has more certification than our child care teachers. And children who aren't in quality child care lag dramatically in their exposure to words, their ability to socialize, even when you put them in four-year-old and three-year-old pre-K, they're already behind because it is about that social emotional development. And it's even worse in, if you look at poverty within the cities, particularly in large cities like mine, you start looking at the poverty level and it really drops off dramatically, the quality child care. All of you, I would bet, were in good quality child care. On average, it's $1,000 a month for a family for quality child care. That's for one child. Now, how does a young mother or father who's making eight bucks an hour afford that? And subsidized child care is very limited. We just don't have enough. And what is there, Libby and I were discussing earlier, is not quality. So Reed Fort Worth is backed up now into early learning and we held an early learning summit that was incredibly successful recently. And I'm very pr proud to say that our Early Learning Alliance is doing phenomenal work. We just need to spread this all over the state if we're going to continue to attract the businesses that we need. I want to dive into something that you, you, you mentioned, which is the high quality pre-K. Um, and this is a question for the panel. Could you, could you talk a little bit more about what high quality pre-K actually looks like? You know, there's a, you know, there, there's, you know, talk about high quality pre-K versus what's, you know, commonly referred to as universal pre-K. Is this an either or situation or is there, is, there, is, there, is there a dynamic to this that people aren't aware of in terms of how to assess, you know, how, how, do you, how to implement pre-K, you know, locally and across the state? I think, I think it's pretty exciting in this state that at least today's discussion is about how can we do this, not should we be doing it. So the, the dialogue has moved from should we do pre-K, which is what people used to say, don't do it, or it's not research. So now we're really looking at how can we do it and how can we do quality. Uh, when people talk about universal, they generally talk about every child. And uh, right now we know that upper income families are buying the best quality early learning they can for their children. Middle income families are really caught because these are families in their early earning years. They're still paying off college tuition and all of a sudden they're hit with a, with a huge bill for child care. And so what we're trying to do through the schools and, uh, schools and through child care is actually put a system in place that is child care and education. And that means it's child care funded through the Workforce Commission and parent pay, and it's education funded through the education system as well. And we need to have the same standards in both. Right now, the standards are very different. In early learning, in pre-K, I told you we get a four. One of the problems is we don't have any limit on how many kids per class or don't have any ratios. So you could have 22, 24 children with one certified teacher, but still, that's crowd control. That is not the, the kind of learning that, ch that children really need. And I know Sarah will go into more depth about what quality looks like. So if you don't have any ratios, you don't have any limit on how many children in the classroom, it's really hard to have a play-based curriculum where children are developing uh, their skills their, and, and getting the reinforcement from the teacher. Yeah, and it was, it, we're, it's really clear what quality is in early learning. As um, Dr. Doggett mentioned, we have the 10 near standards, and so it's not a mystery about quality. It's just whether we have the, the political will to do it, um, and it's around even teachers. So in um, pre-K, for example, our teachers are certified, but which is, good. which is fantastic, and in many states they don't even require pre-K teachers to be certified. The problem is the certification is early childhood through sixth grade, and what that means is in their preparation program, they don't get sufficient um, background in early learning to be a high quality early learning teacher, and quite frankly, they don't get sufficient content background in math and science to be really great teachers at the upper elementary level. So they come out not prepared to do either very well. And even though, and so last legislative session, we really focused on bringing back the, er, the EC through third grade certification. But the problem is even with school districts, 
they want the flexibility to be able to move teachers to different grade levels because there are shifting needs. And while I understand that from a, I was an administrator, I ran schools, I understand that, it actually hurts us in trying to move quality forward. So a big focus is on developing teacher skill. And that's, so that's why at Pre-K for SA, um, we spend um, over 10,000 hours um, in San Antonio um, training teachers all the way from um, teachers who are working with infants all the way up to third grade to help them understand what the quality is because they're not getting it in their preparation program simply because it's not required and it's not how the system is set up. And, and then the second part of that is having an evidence-based curriculum. Early learning is a content area and you actually, there are actual methods for how you build the social emotional learning, how you do brain development, how you build early literacy and math skills. But you have to have the resources and support to do that. And we work with early childhood centers as well as school districts and often when we go into those classrooms we see that not only does the teacher not have the training, the teacher doesn't have the materials that he or she needs in order to be able to do Books. that. A lot of it is strictly raising the profile of how critical this is. We held a CEO roundtable with the top 15, 20 businesses in Fort Worth and we invited their CEO to come and many of them brought their HR directors too. And you would have been shocked at the CEOs of Lockheed and some of the others who truly do not realize that 79% of our children, our low income children in Tarrant County, don't have access to quality childcare. And in Texas, the lack for the certified Rising Star program only about is about 90% lack access to those seats. And I don't think that the I do think the business community, because it's economic development, it's workforce for them, has to buy into this, and they have to come to the table on the public-private partnerships and understand it. So here's the issue. So we can all agree on all this. Here's the problem, and I'll just say it explicitly. All the studies that we look at at the Fed suggest that there's a problem, but the problem particularly is, we, is with at-risk youth. An unacceptably high percentage of our youth are growing up in poverty and, and among the fastest growing demographic groups in this state, and oh, by the way, in the United States, blacks and Hispanics, this is most prevalent among those groups. And so um, we've got to address this but I would also say, while we're doing it through the schools, I've been saying to business leaders and CEOs all through the state, including the number that you met with, uh, if you're waiting for the government to solve this problem, you can stop. It's, it, we've got to. The business community has got to step up and back many of the nonprofits that are reading to at-risk kids uh, starting early. I used to read to a child, by the way, my, when I was in New York, it's more prevalent there. I used to read to a child, and I took 150 people from my firm every week, and we met to children during the lunch hour once a week. We've, we've got to uh, do more to convene business leaders with nonprofit leaders. All these efforts need to improve. We need more government funding, and I think we need to back a lot of the independent nonprofits that are doing this. And th 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 this problem is going to eventually, I'm hopeful, get solved. It's just the, the, the speed with which it happens means there's going to be whole groups of students that miss it, and we will have lower GDP and prosperity in this state. Um, the problem for a lot of business people is they get the issue. Part of our job at the Fed and among us uh, is to help them say, okay, if you believe that, how can I get involved? A lot of them are saying, I'm, I want to help. Do you want me to lobby in Austin? And one of the things, yeah, you probably should do that, but one of the other things is look for local nonprofits your people can go read, by the way, and there are a lot of great examples in the state where people independently are doing this. Um, but we've got to do more of that, and I think the business community's got to take a leadership role in this. And we did last year at my state of the city, I challenged, we talked about Reed Fort Worth and challenged everybody to get involved with the literacy program and send employers, employees to read. But we also challenged them to look at early childhood education at zero to for pre-K. And one of our big businesses, University of Texas, North, North Texas Health Science Center, which is pharmacy, osteopathic, new allopathic school, public health, it's a big operation in Fort Worth, partnered with Lena Pope Home, which is one of our charity nonprofit organizations, to start at the challenge. They said, we'll take that mantle and we will start an on-campus 
child care that's partly subsidized. 50% of their students would be subsidized, 50% would be private pay. They opened it in September, they can take 88 kids, they have a wait list of 110. And the cool thing, and that's, it's a small project, but it's an example that other businesses can replicate. The cool thing has been that the chancellor came to me the other day and said, I was not expecting so many of my employees and my students at UNT to qualify for the vouchers. And the vouchers are being underwritten part with state dollars and part by our philanthropic community. But he said, but the cool thing is I have four employees who came to me and said, we were going to leave and go to another business, but we're staying the reten because of the child care that we can get. So the retention, for to sell it to employers, they want to retain their best employees. They want to keep them in the workforce. And if they're willing to partner and pony up on public-private partnerships, that's, it's a great example. We've got two more businesses looking at the same model that Pope Home is going to partner with to op open. And I'll, Start I'll, small I'll, and I'll add 15 seconds to this. One of the stories of Texas in the last 20 years is migration of people and firms to the state. Uh, th this state is growing and is expected to grow vast. Part of it is migration. Why are people moving here? Lots of businesses are coming from other states. Why? Availability of a high quality workforce. If we don't address this issue, starting with, they actually, they may decide to go elsewhere. I, 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 I want to applaud what they've said. I very much agree that we need public-private partnerships, but I also want to say we're not going to dig ourselves out with public-private partnerships. Yeah, it's just no, one we're of not. the options. It's it's just one it of should the be options. all the above. It's, it has to be. The all federal the above. government actually is doing not a bad job. I know we'd like to blame it on the federal government. We have child care money, we have Head Start money, we have Title I money that could be used, and we have home visiting money in, through multiple sources. Deficit is at the state and the local level. And so what they've done in San Antonio, what they're doing in Fort Worth, what we're trying to do in Austin is fantastic, but it's got to be more. And then the state level, we are really struggling because uh, that's where we're, there's a huge deficit and we need more money from and, the state. And that awareness of yeah. it is right. part of the deficit. The the there's a lot of money there. Yeah. On the business community can drive state government. Exactly. Well, and that's they why will listen to them. Yeah, pre-K for SA was successful because we had our business community involved. That's the key. We have cities that come visit all the time. They say, how can we make this happen? And I always say, you have to go to your business leader. San Antonio, first of all, is a very generous business community and the philanthropic community is very committed to young children and to education in general. And so it really works there. But even in San Antonio, we have more to do in terms of helping all businesses to become aware of how critical, because we're actually a workforce development initiative. Our, our mission is actually to change San Antonio's workforce in one generation through early childhood education, right? So people don't think about it that way, but, that, but high quality early childhood education has a seven to 10% return on investment. That's just at four. If you start earlier, it can be as high as 13%. That, those are economists who have demonstrated that return. No, nothing else in education gets that kind of return on investment, and nothing else in education has a strong research base behind it, like early learning. So on this issue of getting state funding, what I've learned, and you wouldn't think this would be the case, so the state has lots of multinationals, over 50 Fortune 500 companies in the state of Texas, about 10% more. In, but, but, and they're set up very well to lobby in D.C. A lot of them I've talked to CEOs saying they're not as accustomed to lobbying because they have multinational businesses. And so one of the things that what you're saying will help them do is they're reorienting and realize I've got to do more lobbying in Austin. A lot of them are not quite as set up as well as you'd think. To, to be influencers well, there. And we have to give them the messages too. Yes. That's one of our jobs. That's in early right. learning, we're not as good at messaging and figuring out how do we get this out there. And that's, I, that's what I spend the majority of my time doing is helping to give messages to different constituents, whether it's the business, whether it's education, whoever it is. So because people are supportive, they don't know how to help. And so that's part of our work too. And every mayor and every council member has to pick up the drum and beat the drum on education. In 10 years, we do have a good workforce now. Yep. In 10 years, we'll have significant holes in our workforce. Yep. And in 20 years, we'll really have holes if we don't handle this now. And part of Reed Fort Worth's initiative was every, pro every project and every program that the city of Fort Worth offers now has to have a literacy component. And think about it. Cities touch children. We had 6,000 children in our summer care program alone. We have 10,000 or plus in our after-school program. 
we're not the school district, but we're filling that gap at the community level. Then we have a program called Citizens Crime Control Prevention District, which is a half cent of our sales tax. And we award several million dollars in programs for community efforts. And last year we said every one of those programs has to now have a literacy component. Raising that drum and using the bully pulpit of all of us and all of you can make a major difference in the fact that we stress quality education. And here, one last comment. Here's the good news. I look nationwide and, and what you see in the United States is many cities and states, are, their populations are flat to down. Uh, in fact, 35 plus states in this country because uh, growth is slowing. Texas is not one of those states. Texas growth and our projections for Texas growth are very, very positive. So the good news is we've got the money. We've got the wealth, we're enormously wealthy. We've got the population, we're gonna have the population. So there, there, there are reasons why other states and cities might, not, might struggle to deal with this issue. There really is no excuse for Texas because we've got the wealth and we've got the money, just a matter now of doing it. So one in 10, oh, sorry, sorry, one in 10 children in the United States live in Texas. Isn't that so amazing? that's why we've got to solve this problem. It's because we have the money, but we also have the children. So I do just want to clarify what we're talking about when we're saying solving this or solving the issue or the deficit at the state level. Is this strictly a funding issue? Because obviously in the 2017 session, you know, there was the, the funding that was in the pre-K grant program before was cut. This is not looking like it's going to be a bigger budget year. At least that's you know, not what the indications are. You know, what, what should we lo be looking for? What should uh, folks be kind of talking about for pre-K this session? Is it just about funding or is it is it more than that? It isn't just about funding. It's about increasing the level of quality that's offered for the, those who take care of the very youngest of our children from birth up. It's about making certain that parents are aware and in increasing the state's rising star, four-star program, the number of slots there. And that's not just dollars. That can come into partnership with the community colleges and the school districts putting a stronger focus and everyone on how do we offer this level of teaching. I think it's about raising the profile. You tend to think of those that are taking care of babies as just your grandmother type who are good child care. But in today's world, that won't surpass. You've got to have somebody who's willing to talk to them and increase their vocabulary, who will read to them, who really understands. And that's going to come with us demanding. And it won't take just money. It's going to take the demand for a quality education. Yeah, the standards are really low in yeah. for the expect not just for the teachers, but even what is required in child care centers. And so if they are quality, it's only because the people in the centers have decided that's the kind that they want and they're able to afford that. So we've really got to look at, but money, it takes money to increase that. And, and if you look at um, the quality for pre-K, for example, it starts with full day and Texas only funds half day. So right out of the gate, we can't get to quality because we don't have full day programs unless somehow the other half of the funding comes in. So that's a huge part is getting the other funding put into the funding formula. What happened last time was it came in a grant. So all of the districts, so many districts were able to expand from half day to full day and then the money was pulled away. So now they have the teachers, they, they started up these programs and then there wasn't the funding to do it. So they had to make a really tough choice. Do we continue with that, which means taking money from someplace else, or do we just go back to half day? So we've got to at least get the other half of the funding for full day pre-K in order to get anywhere close to quality. And I agree with Sarah. There's a half of a day that we haven't had the funding for. And if we this session without the money for that other half day, pre-K will have lost. And uh, the idea that we have a great pre-K program will be, you know, continuing to go down because other states, I mean, Alabama gets a 10 on quality and they're serving 24% or probably more of all of their four-year-olds, not just their risk, but all of their four-year-olds. And they've done that in the last 10 years. So you can do it if there's a will. And, and there's, there is additional money flowing in from the feds coming from HUD and coming from the Department of Education. It's coming through the state, but we have to make certain that it's put into the right programs, that it's put into programs that are gonna benefit our children, that the focus is there. I, I wanna talk a little bit about, uh, you know, the, the innovation in terms of the partnerships that you've talked about and trying to work around just, you know, relying on specific funding. Um, I also want, I wanted to kind of focus in on some, on smaller communities, rural, you know, other communities that don't, may not have as many businesses based in them too, but still have the same need for access to early childhood education and pre-K. Uh, 
you know, what, what can be done innovatively to address the needs of those communities, which may not be able to have as access to, you know, access, the same kind of access you have in bigger cities? Yeah. Well, go ahead, Olivia. Well, all, all of the city, all the school districts have access to four-year-old pre-K money for their at-risk and three-year-old pre-K money. We haven't talked a lot about that because that's fairly new. It's been there, but now we have cities like Austin and San Antonio, I think, I know Dallas has hit this big time, is, are pulling down that money. One of the innovations, and we've touched on it, is the public-private partnership, which is let's see where the children are, because children are going to centers. And so why are we requiring them to come to school when they're already out there in perhaps a really good uh, childcare center, like we have Mainspring here and Open Door. So can we look at those centers and provide some of that school funding in the centers where the children already are. So that's an innovation which is, I think, very much in play here in Texas. There are others that people will talk about. One other thing you wouldn't normally think of that also affects rural areas, and we've got a heat map at the Dallas FEC of where you lack Wi-Fi. And technology is important, so we've actually worked with a number of communities, I'll give you an example, McCall McAllen, Texas, work with the mayor, nonprofits, to get them to convene a group to create Wi-Fi which is increasingly critical if, if, if students at a young age. And we still have areas in this state that don't have good access to Wi-Fi. So this would be another, I guess, low-hanging fruit that we could address. It doesn't cost that much money. Particularly for professional development mm -hmm. that Sarah's doing. Yeah. And if they've got child care centers, and many of the small rural communities do have child care centers, to be able to increase their quality to demand that that if they're going to receive state dollars, and many of those are subsidized child care in the rural communities, the state has to up their standards of saying we've got to have better teachers in those. If they don't have businesses to help underwrite it, then the state has to come in or local government's got to come in and say, we expect a higher quality here. You need to hire more teachers on these state dollars. So one thing I've learned, I've been in Texas now three years, is the reason I think this is so hard you need local leadership in many cases. So you might have many cities that have excellent local leadership and others that have not. And so one of the, the challenges for the state, and this is why businesses, you know, with the more sessions like this where businesses in some of these areas realize we can do something, they may push for it, but it has to be done to a great extent locally. Uh, it needs help from uh, Austin, you know, from state government, but, it, but it's got, it takes local leadership to do this. And local leadership's got to understand this touches every single thing that every town and every city does. From crime to, you know, after school to economic development, it's very circular. There isn't a spot on the jobs that we do that education and early childhood isn't going to touch. So anybody who's not beating that drum is not looking holistically at the picture. Toward that leadership, the mayor, uh, I was happy to help, and we, Sarah helped too. We convened uh, teams, we invited teams from 25 of our largest cities. They, actually, Texas is so big, 25 large cities. 20 teams came at their own expense to Fort Worth, heard from the mayor, got to see some of the great innovations that they have done, and shared ideas. Because really, in our state, we have amazing things going on. There's not anything that's going on outside the state that's not already going on inside. Our problem is we haven't shared the good ideas enough. We haven't gotten together and said, oh, are you doing that? How are you doing that? Let me, let me try it. And use the expertise that's in Sarah's shop and up there in Fort Worth and in Dallas and here in Austin to share those ideas. And so it was, leadership it is was so well received that now the Lubbock area the Amarillo, Lubbock, that whole area is doing one in April because suddenly people are going, well, they're doing this and they're doing this and they're doing this. Maybe, like Libby said, we replicate what they're doing. And I think that is And we put the focus on it, and I think that makes a big difference. The important, the context matters. That really, you can't just do what we've done in San Antonio and then take it over to another. You really do have to look at the context, whether it's rural or urban, but that doesn't mean there aren't lessons to be learned. And, and I think that we also have to help families understand what high quality looks like and whether they're getting it or not. Um, one of the things that we um, discovered in San Antonio is we were working with families to say, this is what you should be looking for, and then we mapped out where all the quality centers are based on accreditation ratings and realize there are some parts of our community where families don't actually have an, a choice. Like they, there is no 
high quality center in their area. So it's all, it's, so you've got to work on both, helping families to know what to look for, but also not just putting the burden on them to say, well, you should be sending your child to a quality center when they don't have those. And so that's our job too, is to help and raise the quality. And that's a real eye-opening yep. experience, yep. Sarah. We mapped that also to look at citywide and countywide with our county judge, where were what we call quality child care centers. And surprisingly, they were incredibly lacking in our poor lower income areas. The and federal, I think nobody really had realized that until you see it on a heat map. The federal government provided a few, many years ago, some race to the top early learning challenge money. Unfortunately, Texas didn't apply for it. We should have, because the 20 states that got it really moved forward on, uh, on this quality issue around child care. And they established something called a QRIS, but it's a quality rating system. So think of hotels. You know, you can stay in a four star, five star, three star. Same thing with child care. You can get a star rating system. So we now have a star rating system. It's not that robust. It's not that well but used. But it's a start. It's a start. So we have a long way to go. But it, we, I, I'm with you. I want to improve it. I want to see it funded. I want to see families know about it. I want to see actually every program included in it, which is what Kentucky did. They said, we have a star rating system. You have a license. We want you in our star rating system. With a license, you're a one star. You want to move up to five, we'll help you do it. Uh, and and they've, that, that's one way to improve it. And so, many times it's a very f small deficiency that's keeping them from being rated quality. It's, to, it's a lack of a certain number of books in their classroom. In their, it's, it's very minor. If they can get, if somebody can help them get past that stumbling block, many of them will improve their quality. We just did a mayor's proclamation great early child care center and they got recognized as at a four-star level and she didn't ever even applied and she said now she's got double the wait list of parents who want their kids there that she thought she would strictly as a result of now being recognized as quality well, and we just took it on and said you're just surely you're just missing three or four things she went okay maybe I can do those and so she retrained her teachers and did it, several other things it, that's a little thing but it's a start that, and, and that's, but the people who are running the child care centers are often, they're teaching, they're running, yeah. they don't have time to even look at the rating system, much less put together the documentation it takes to get accredited or to raise their stars. And so when you have support systems, that's one of the pieces at Pre-K for SA that we work with the child care centers to figure out how can we help you? How can we be supportive? How can we bring you together in a network so that you understand you're not out there alone? That there are other people that are working on this, and how do and it's and and if we already know how to put together a parent handbook, why don't we just share that with you? Why do you have to make it up yourself? You shouldn't. But it's they don't have the time to really think about that, and so um, it's really important that those of us that have the resources and the knowledge are out there helping the child care centers because they want to be better. They don't always know how, and they don't always know how it impacts their business. If they, you just were able to raise your standard a little bit, you could actually bring in more business. So, so this kind of transitions well into a question I had about assessment and, you know, uh, you know uh, how, how, to, how to rate success for programs like Pre-K 4SA and what's happening at Fort Worth. And, you know, there's all, obviously there's no consensus here about what, what the best way is. I know uh, funding for the program in the San Antonio is, kind of, is on the ballot in 2020, and there's been some disagreement about how to assess, you know, how, whether the, you know, how, this is the success level of the program. And so I just kind of, this is a question starting, maybe starting with you, Dr. Beret, but for the whole panel, just how do you assess success for these programs when so much of it is, you know, it, being able to see long term what this is, it's not, it's, and how do you assess things in the shorter term so people can see whether these, whether these programs are on the right track or not on the right track, and how do you show, because I don't think there's any disagreement here that there needs to be some level to show accountability on these programs. Uh, so how, how, how do you guys think we should do that? Yeah, I think everybody agrees there needs to be accountability all the way through education. We've gotten into a, a bad habit of looking at minutia, though, and looking at finite little pieces of data and trying to decide about programs. So we have programs looking at one year of data in one school, and then that's different than last year. So off they go in this direction, and the next year it's different. And so the same thing can happen in early learning. So let's be clear, it's not giving standardized tests to infants or three or four year olds. That's um, very clear, even though that seems to be our answer to everything um, in education. But there are things that, so it's a long-term endeavor, so you have to track long-term. Um, and, and in early learning, you'll see 
um, evidence as, as far out as 40 years. We have research that shows that children who were in high quality early learning um, and then compared to a group of peers who were not, and they've tracked throughout their lifetime, are still showing um, benefits from that. So it's huge. But we also have um, evidence that it works right away, too. So at Pre-K First, we have an external evaluator who comes in and looks at our assessments of our student learning, where they started, where they end the year. And we show that our kids come in below the national norm, and they leave well above the national norm. They're ready for kindergarten. But then what happens when they go to, go to kinder and first and second grade? And yes, we do want the third grade reading score is huge. But that's, it, that is one piece of data that we need to look at over time. And are we moving the needle across the board? And I always say people get, at pre k first say because we run four centers that serve 500 children each, people think that's what this, it's about those five, those 2,000 kids. And while that's impressive, um, we do, they're phenomenal places. And I can say that I didn't build it. I just showed up and got to help run it. Uh, but if that's all we did, yeah, that would be great, but not that impressive. We're moving the needle across San Antonio. So we're looking at kindergarten readiness. There's a, um, uh, an instrument called the EDI, which is an assessment of kinder readiness. And are we moving that needle across the city? Third grade reading scores, are they going up across the city? Not in any one school district or any one school, but over time, are we doing that? That's how you assess that. And then you can start to look at later indicators of um, childhood um, adolescence and whether we have kids more engaged and, and higher um, rates of, of high school graduation and even college going and going through. There are ways to assess it, but it's, you have to understand it's a long-term endeavor and that we get impatient. We want things to change overnight in spite of the fact that these problems of poverty and everything else have been around for generations. So I like what, uh, sorry, go ahead. I like, I'll, I'll bookend this and then we'll turn. I, I like what Sarah said because what I see lacking because we're having this conversation constantly and what I do, is you got to start at 100,000 feet and say, nationally, what is the evidence on, on pre-K and improving children's literacy and addressing at-risk youth on uh, incarceration, incomes, all these things? And that research, hard to debate it. I mean, I've looked at it and it's compelling. So then you look at the program locally and uh, the question is not is it perfect, as you said, the question is, uh, directionally, are we heading right? And what I see missing, as you, Sarah, said very well, too much focus on the minutia. The leadership, the mayors, others need to start on the, with the big picture. This is compelling and put it in context. I don't hear this part enough. We, we do have good data. And uh, I know that Jackie Porter at their Texas Ed Education Agency can show it to you, uh, you know, across the state. I know in Austin we have really good data. There's a kindergarten entry assessment, so every child when they get to kindergarten, or sometimes it's sampling, sometimes it's every child, but we are assessing those children to see if they're kindergarten ready. And in cities like Austin or in school districts like Austin and in Dallas, we have really tracked and have the data to show that children are doing very much better. It's interesting because I was recently at a presentation where they were talking about our social emotional development. And that has been a big emphasis in uh, Austin ISD. And children that are getting strong foundation in those areas are even doing better than those that aren't. So there, we have good data. We need to get it out. Yeah, raising the profile of how to use that data. That was one thing. We have a data dashboard. And, and parents can look at that now and say, because parents will go, I, I know, Mayor, that you're talking about the other neighborhood schools, but my school's fine. My school's perfect. And I'll go, well, you know, let's look at your school. Let's look at where their kindergarten readiness is. Let's look at where their third grade reading level is. And they're always shocked. They're truly shocked. They don't know. You have to take, there's a ton of data that the state has, but you've got to take it and break it out and put it where people live. You put it where their child is and how it impacts their child or how it impacts their business. And you superintendents. 10,000 programs that they have to deal with. But there's great data that shows these child care centers feeding into this school have an incredible, their kids have an incredible record of being ready to go on. So drop back and take that data and look at that. But I will agree with Bob. Mayors and all leaders have to take a look at the compelling, and that's how we started, the compelling evidence at the top we have a bad of crime and economic development. We have a bad habit in this country to talk about financial things. We invest this, we'll get this. You do this kind of fiscal thing. You'll, 
the most valuable investment, and most any business leader would know this, the most valuable investment you can make is in your human capital, okay? And we should start there. And, but we're not good, and I don't know why, in the United States, I, we are very uneven in, in stepping forward, say the most valuable investment we can make um, is, in our, in, is, our, is in our youth and our young people. It's a money thing. It's not a nice helping thing. It's a money. You want to make more money? You want more GDP? You want a more prosperous community? And I think more we can connect those things nationally and locally, I think this, this is the most obvious, highest return investment I, we could be making. I'm convinced of that sitting at the Fed. And, and the reason that is, is, is going back to something that um, Dr. Doggett said, which is the social emotional learning, which sounds like a really squishy thing with, you know, peace and happiness and love and all of that. It's really not that at all. Social emotional learning, it is that, but it's, but it's really about brain development and the sense of how we understand our behavior and its, and its effect on outcomes. And there's a process, a brain process called executive function, which is really the ability to say, here's a goal I have. I'm going to do something to try and reach that goal. And then I'm going to assess whether I reached that goal and did my plan work and how do I adjust. High quality early learning helps children develop that skill and that brain process. And that's really the best and the, and the most powerful outcome of high quality early learning because that executive function is tied to better behavior in adolescence, less turbulence in that crazy time of life. It's also tied to better um, college going, but also college completion because we often prepare children academically for college, but that's not why kids drop out of college typically. They drop out because their financial aid runs out, they didn't get the class they need, their housing, and they don't, if they don't have strong executive function, they don't know how to negotiate those kind of problems. So when children develop executive function early on, then they're able to negotiate life in a different way. That's why you see these strong economic outcomes because that's also tied to career. And especially for this current generation, this having one career in your life is gone. I mean, it's been gone for a while, but it for sure is. And so a strong executive function helps people say, okay, what am I doing in my life and how do I connect that to the job I want or the life I want? And if I went to 10 other countries, Germany, Japan, South Korea, China, uh, who has have much higher productivity scores than we do, you wouldn't even have, they, they would get, wouldn't even need to make the argument. They already, they've already bought this. They're way ahead of us. We have allowed ourselves to lag. We rank 25th out of 35 industrialized countries in math, science, and reading. I don't know why we don't talk about it more. We've allowed ourselves to erode. We used to be very strong. It's one of the reasons why our productivity is sluggish. And there are five years before children even enter kindergarten that we're ignoring. That's right. That's right. And there's a, an ongoing study that Cook Children's Hospital is doing, our big children's hospital on ACEs, adverse childhood experience. It's exposure to abuse, lack of quality food, um, not enough sleeping, poverty levels. How does that in, uh, impact a child? And part of their studies that's coming out on the preliminary look is that the kids who are in quality childcare even though they live in a really bad situation and maybe are exposed to abuse, maybe the kid is, doesn't get home, mother works a bar and, and gets them in the middle of the night or whatever, they are a lot more resilient to the effects of their environment if they are exposed on a daily basis to quality childcare than children who are not in quality childcare. That's the adult child interaction again, is, is those strong adult child interactions is what supports brain development. And so when children are in these high quality centers, they have lots of adult child interactions that support, it, that help to mitigate the trauma that they might experience in their lives. And so it benefits everybody, but high quality early learning benefits children who are exposed to trauma even more so. That's why we see those results even stronger for, for children who live with traumatic experiences. Okay, I wanna give us a few uh, minutes for questions that you have. I just wanna ask one question before uh, before I hand it over, and that's just uh, briefly for each of you, just one takeaway that you want to make sure we all leave with about this issue and what we need to be thinking about beyond the hour that we spent here. I'll start with uh, Mr. Kaplan. If you want higher GDP and prosperity in the United States, we need to dramatically improve our investment in early childhood uh, outcomes in early pre-K and early childhood. It will directly translate into a more prosperous country. And I'll dovetail on that and say, if you want cities that are safe, it, vibrant, strong, where people love to live and are engaged in their community, you have to push for this issue. And I agree with what they've said and said, we need federal, 
state, and local funding to make it work. And the one thing I would leave is that it's not about discrete academic skills, it's about brain development. People get too, that we think that if we can mimic, get kids to mimic reading and math earlier, that somehow they're ahead. That's not what it's about. It's actually about the brain development. We, we, we do have a few minutes for questions if anyone has one. Yes, sir. One thing that we talk about, oh, I don't need a mic. Thank you, though. I'll, I'll, the I'll people in the back. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Can you hear me? OK, um, so in our program, we talk a lot about the school to prison pipeline. Um, how does, or this is probably an obvious question, but do you think that a quality pre-K program and a quality EC program, uh, if that would disrupt that school to prison pipeline? Yes, because it disrupts, it makes them much more successful, and, and I keep using the third grade benchmark, but it's true. The average level of reading in Texas prisons is second grade six months. They're below the third grade level. So there's corresponding data that shows kids coming in ready to learn with the brain development, then if they're learning through kindergarten first, second, into third, have a much lower instance of being incarcerated. And less likely to drop out. And, less, and that goes, yeah. And it, it goes back to executive function, that connecting your behavior to outcomes. And if that's what we see also in people who end up incarcerated, um, often they're at an early age have not if, had strong executive function. Um, so we talk a lot about the kids and how it helps them, but a lot of the teachers, like in order to be certified to do this, teachers have to spend a lot of money and not get very much in return for their pay. So would, I mean, as a master's student, we're shelling, you know, people are shelling out hundreds of thousands of dollars to get certified for this and then s struggling to pay their bills. So is some of the funding that would be contributed towards that going towards paying teachers a livable salary? Yes. I think there, there are two answers to that. One is teachers that are in, uh, pre-K for three and four years that's paid through the school district, which is primarily in schools, but could be in child care center, centers, as we've talked about, they will get a teacher salary. It's commensurate with what they would get as first and second grade, third grade teacher. So that, it, those need to be higher, we know that, but at least that's much better than child care workers. And if you're working in child care in this state, you're, one, you're some of the most poorly paid uh, people in our state. You're usually on some sort of uh, state subsidy, uh, you know, food stamps or something else. And you're right. Why would somebody go and get certified to go get a low wage job? So we're trying to address that by increasing the, the programs in the Texas Rising Star with bringing together partnerships between school districts and, commu and uh, community settings. But we're not there yet. But we need, you know, we also need more city funding to do things like San Antonio said. So, San, so pre K for SA pays a higher salary than the school districts do. Our teachers also work a longer year, um, and I don't know if they actually work any more than teachers in school districts. They just get paid for all the days they work, and a lot of that is professional learning. We have three weeks of professional learning before the kids ever show up, and that doesn't matter if you've been with us one day or 20 years. It's a continuous mode of learning and, and lots of support and instructional specialists who are on campus every day. That, that's a critical piece of it. Um, with our child care centers, that's an ongoing struggle because they don't get paid, and so there's high turnover. And um, that's one of the things we, with our child, our child care center partners, we're trying to think about what would that look like if we paid child care center teachers more, and where would that money come from? Uh, yeah. Yeah, the mic's coming. <laughs> Hi, I'm Julianne. I'm an Austin ISD pre-K teacher. Hooray right uh, for you. Good yes. for Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if, um, if y'all know of anything on the horizon with Texas moving towards class size limits or ratios for our public pre-K program. Um, you know, I have 20 students in a dual language program alone. She proves our point, right? Yep. <laughs> yep. Do we need ratios? It's being done in local, through local, local. efforts, uh, and, but no, I don't think that's going to change at the state level for a while. I mean, we just really want to get more funding and hope that, that the city and the uh, school districts will make up. Just, 
our school district, 70% of them are actually offering full day. So that means they're taking money from other grades to put it in so that children in pre-K can get a full day. If we could get that funding from the state legislature, then that would free up money to maybe do some other things. And we just strictly have to raise their profile of how critical this is, this issue is. Remember, kindergarten is not mandatory in Texas. It's not mandatory that you're in school till first grade. And that is something that, just dropping that back that can change a lot, particularly on our immigrant side, first time Americans, first time in Texas, many of them don't understand how critical childcare is. It's not in their culture. And we're working really hard to raise that profile. The state's gonna have to come alongside and work on that too. And, and just as a point of reference, the national standard for ratios is one to 10, meaning you, in a classroom of 20, you would have a teacher and an assistant teacher at the, at the least. And that's what you have at We San do, Antonio. we do. Hello, my wife and I actually taught uh, school for many years. We live on the border region in McAllen, the Rio Grande Valley. Um, and we always had access to, it's one of the third poorest counties in the United States of America. One of, it is the third poorest county. But a lot of these programs that we had access to were there, but I found that, my wife and I also found that the, the best investment was when we had spoken to the parents of the children and had asked the parents to invest time as well. But I don't feel that you guys touched upon that in any way. Is there any way that we could uh, what are you guys' thoughts Parent on that? Parent involvement is the single biggest factor to driving this, to raising the awareness, to helping teach. Teachers, parents as teachers is one of our big pieces of our Read Fort Worth initiative. And I tr have always been a firm believer, and I think the data shows too, you've got to engage parents. And that goes very cyclical. I tell the business community, you need to be giving your employees an extra 30 to minutes to an hour a month to go to their child's school. They've got to figure out, you talk to more parents who don't go to their child's school. They don't know their teacher and they don't know their principals. And that's appalling. I was the classic mother who was always at school and my kids would say, don't come to school, mother. I go, well then don't tell them I'm your mother because I'm coming <laughs> anyway. But I think it, parents as teachers is one of the things that we're missing. Early on, we have a program at JPS, which is our public county hospital that's just getting started and books for babies and parents as teachers and they give them a set of books at six months the nurse calls them follows up gives them a second set to try to encourage and this is they're done in English and Spanish particularly uh, to try to teach these parents that they've got to be reading to that baby and we need to expand that and, and it's slow sledding as they we say. We all agree. <coughs> yes. Parent engagement We didn't talk huge. about it but no, it's a huge it's, issue. It's a, it's there. And it's the way that we're going to change the education system, helping parents be leaders in education change. That's, that's our focus through parent engagement. It's not just about four, but what happens later on and how do you engage the community and the business and demand that we have better care for our young children. And, and parents stay engaged. Are who are voting in your elected officials at the local level, at the state level, at the school board level, and at the federal level. And they're the ones who can make the demands and the changes. Um, I've heard y'all talk a lot about brain development for little kids, and I was just wondering if y'all want to talk a little bit about um, the importance of early childhood intervention for um, zero to three for kids with disabilities. Yeah, it's critical, and that's why um, the federal laws actually help us in this way, because school districts are required to find help its child find, find children that have special needs and get them into programs earlier. So we know that um, the earlier we can help children who might potentially have um, special needs, the sooner, the better off the impact is there as well. The, the more likely we are to have the children be able to be successful um, and to have their families understand the disability and how they can be supportive as well. It's a critical component of what we do. It's also a wonderful opportunity for uh, people with disabilities, children with disabilities, to be integrated in with all of our kids because everybody benefits in that regard. Yeah, pre-K first day, we don't actually have special education classrooms. The children with special needs are in our classrooms. Because of the way that we teach, it really works um, for all children. And there, are, I will say there are some children with highly unique needs that need a smaller setting than we have, but in general, you wouldn't know if you went into our rooms which children have special needs because we meet the needs of all kids where they are. And early childhood lends itself much better to that than the later grade teaching styles. Uh, 
Uh, hu hello, <laughs> y'all. Um, my name is Richard Carp. I'm one of those thousands of chemical engineers that moved to this state because of the economics. Luckily, my children's early education was in a sparsely populated state where they did quite well. And so I haven't had to address this with my children, but my grandchildren is a different story because they, of course, are growing up here. My question has to do with how much of a hurdle do you think the situation or how much of a hurdle do you think it is that the fruits of our investments are not going to mature until after a lot of these managers, politicians, are going to be well retired and gone? In other words, we're investing, which I want to do, but it's going to be 20-some years before these kids hit the job market and are able to provide that increase in productivity that we all are, sh are indicating is the fruit that we are going to get. Because I just know from working in the chemical in industry that plant managers are very reluctant to spend a bunch of money on a project that won't show fruition until well after they're gone. Yeah, and that, and that is, we have to, it, although the best or the, or the strongest in, um, investments or the benefits are later, it doesn't mean there aren't early signs of success. And we have that at Pre-K for SA. So we can see, we just had a study done that children who were at Pre-K for SA and are now in first grade compared to children who were on our waiting list, and we have a long waiting list because we don't have enough slots, that did not get in and are now in first grade, our children tend to go to lower performing schools as measured by the accountability system, yet they read just as well in first grade as children who go to higher performing schools. So you can see what the, the external researchers concluded is there is a lasting impact even two years out. And so, and we know that, as I said, our kids come in below the national norm and leave far above the national norm at the end of the year. So that's part of the communicating that the benefits are happening right now, but they're going to be even more powerful later on. So we have to do both, what's happening now and what's happening later. So I used to teach leadership for a living at, uh, at Harvard for 10 years, wrote a few books, and this is the definition of leadership. Leadership is about, and by the way, as I said, the countries that are right now beating us, you don't need to convince them that this is the definition of leadership. You have to look long-term, there are certain problems, and, and the leaders need to think longer term. We need to build the country, invest in the country, and I'm hopeful that with this kind of leadership we have here and input, leaders in this country and voters too uh, are going to demand that our leaders step up and prioritize and ma really make this. It's hard for me to see that this isn't the top priority. Human capital investment in human capital probably isn't the biggest challenge for this state, cities in the state, and this country. But that takes leadership to articulate it, explain it. I'm very confident that with leadership, the country as a whole and the citizens. When I go around this state and the country talking about this issue and you explain the economic benefits, I don't have any trouble getting people to, to buy in. But it takes leadership to say, this is not priority number five, it's priority number one. There's a difference and that takes leadership. And I think you'll find at the local level with leaders, most mayors are looking long-term at their city. It's a 10 year, 20 year strategic plan that's why you have to engage not the plant department head, but the CEO who's running that plant. He's got to buy in because that's generally where the long-term vision is. Who's going to be in his factory? Who's going to be his next round of engineers when you retire or when your children are in that pipeline? They're the ones who are more likely to believe the long-term payoff is there. We're going to leave it at that because we've run out of time. Uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you for your wonderful questions. And please join me in thanking this wonderful panel. It's a wonderful conversation. Thank you all. Please enjoy the rest of the festival.